Good morning, church. How you doing? Doing well? Doing well? Thanks for uh, uh, letting me come back and hang with you guys. Uh, how, how many of you guys got a chance to be here last time I was here? It's been a little bit, a little bit. A few of you guys. Okay, awesome. Well, it's good to be back, and I was honored to be able to step in and hang out this weekend, too, while your pastors are on a little family time, a little vacay, and and uh, how many thankful for great pastors uh, like the Ansels who just love and serve you know, one of the things I want to just take a moment to be able to encourage you guys, I know you guys are already great at this, but, uh, you know, one of the privileges we have is, is to keep encouraging and lifting up in prayer, uh, as well as just an encouragement, you know, of our pastors and leaders. Um, sometimes I think it's easy to assume, you know, they get up and preach great messages of faith or encouragement that, well, maybe maybe they're not struggling with stuff, or maybe they don't have challenges, or maybe they're not go- having to fight the enemy like you guys are, but obviously I know you, that you know they're going through stuff too. They, they got to fight their own sort of battles as well. So, man, it just means the absolute world. Keep encouraging. Notes, you know, whether it's Facebook, whether it's handwritten stuff, whatever the medium is, Instagram, you know, just share the love, encourage them, and keep being the biggest fans, biggest cheerleaders, so they can stay encouraged and strong themselves and keep leading a great church because y'all are making a difference in this city. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up one more time for your pastors. They're amazing. And I'm excited to bring the word uh, this morning to you guys. It's an honor and a privilege. And just really feel like this is a, a word for you guys. This is kind of hot off the press, as I like to call it. You know, when I get the privilege to, to travel and minister, sometimes there's a word that God will kind of inspire me to teach in several places. Uh, but today, this is the first time I'm bringing this word uh, right here to Family Church. So this is, uh, th- this is, I'm excited. I've been loving preaching it this morning, and I believe it's going to encourage you and bless you today. So let me begin, if you're ready. You guys ready? You guys ready for the word? Uh, Let me begin by making uh, a declaration, and I hope it's something that becomes uh, a mantra for you, something that you remember to keep you full of faith for what God wants to do. And here's what I want to encourage you with, that God can use anyone from anywhere at any time to do anything. Okay, let let me repeat that. God can use anyone from anywhere, at any time, to do anything, okay? Come on. Hopefully by the end of the service, you'll all be clapping for that, okay? So we'll just warm it up. We'll just warm it up here a little bit. I, I, I hope to say it enough times in today's message to where it almost slightly annoyingly echoes in your mind the rest of this week, and that is that God can use anyone from anywhere, at any time, to do absolutely anything. That's the truth. Let me pray, and then we're going to unpack this this word here this morning. Father, I thank you for being with us today. Thank you for this amazing church, your great pastors that you've put in place here. God, bless them and let them be refreshed on their vacation. And God, I thank you for this church that has been so warm in receiving me and my family. But God, I pray that you bless them, you strengthen them. Lord, let faith rise in the house this morning. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, hey, you know, honestly, the truth is, because I know myself and I know humanity, the the reality is, is that before I was probably even done with that statement, there's many in the room that would have already started building a list of reasons why that's not true in your life. There, there would be many who have started to stack up the argument against that reality. Like, oh, okay, anyone, anywhere, anytime. They're like, oh, well, you, let, me, let me buy you coffee afterward, and I'm going to explain to you a couple things as to why. That might be true for my friend. That might be true for, for last service. But is it true for me? Is, can God really use anyone? Can God really you know, reach into anywhere? Can he work in any time? Can he do anything in my life? And could God work in and through my life? You know what? That challenge is is real because every single one of us has an enemy that's trying to sabotage our lives, right? Trying to get you to doubt. Trying to get you to second guess 
the goodness of God, trying to get you to second guess God's plan and purpose for your life, trying to get you to doubt the goodness and the power of God, but also to doubt your ability to actually fulfill what God has for your life. There, there is the great second guesser, as I would like to maybe call him, you know, the enemy, the devil. He's always whispering, always trying to get you to doubt the plan of God. Re remember in the very beginning with Adam and Eve, that was kind of his tactic. He really hasn't changed strategy very much. So we got to get wise on what he does. Here's what he does. At the very beginning, God says, you can have everything. Can't have that tree. And what is it, you know, the enemy, first thing he does, trying to get them to eat that tree, eat the fruit of that tree. And what does he say to them? Man, did, did God really say? Right out of the gate, trying to, to get them to second guess the word of God. Tries to get them to doubt what God has said. Not only doubt what God has said, but also to doubt the intention that God is a good God. Because what the enemy says to them is, wait, listen, you're not going to die if you eat that fruit. God actually knows you're going to be like him. Basically saying to them, listen, God's holding out on you. God's got something good that he's not let you in on. And so right away, the enemy is trying to get us as humanity to question the goodness of God, to question the power of God. And also, as we know, we often get into modes of insecurity. We get into modes of self-doubt, questioning. Man, if God really can do anything with anyone, anywhere, anytime, but, but, but what about me? What about my situation? So the enemy is always going to try to get us to second guess the goodness of God, to get us to second guess what he said, what he is, who he is, and even what our ability is to actually fulfill the plan of God. But here's what I want to encourage us to do. We've got to learn how to second guess the second guesser, okay? We've got to learn how to challenge the second guesser. We've got to learn how to challenge those thoughts and those negative attitudes that are trying to hold us back. He's just jealous I didn't shout him out, so that's fine. <laughs> we got to learn how to challenge that negative thought because the truth is God can use anyone from anywhere at any time to do anything. But as soon as I say that, the doubt's going to come. The, the second guessing is going to creep in. The, but you don't know my experience is going to creep in. But we got to learn how to challenge that. we got to learn how to, how to have that in our life but be able to come against it and to still accomplish what God has for us. And I think about uh, one of the icons of the Bible, the, one of the more famous characters throughout the Word of God. His name is David. Uh, David would be an example of somebody who God had a great plan for, but he had to fight the onslaught all throughout of people second-guessing him, uh, getting him, trying to get him to doubt who he was and what God had called him to do. We, we see that right from the beginning of David's kind of story that he emerges onto the scene. Uh, the current king of Israel at the time was named Saul, and God was transitioning from him, and he was looking for a new king. So he tells the prophet of the day, Samuel, he says, hey, I want you to go to a man named Jesse's house and you're going to anoint one of his sons as the next king of Israel. So it's going to be a big deal. So the prophet shows up to Jesse's house and says, Jesse, bring your sons. I'm going to anoint the next king of Israel. So Jesse brings all of his sons and, uh, and Samuel is kind of praying over these guys and he's like, man, None of these are it. God hasn't selected any one of these. And he says, Jesse, do you have any others? Is this it? And Jesse's like, that's right. We have another one. He's out in the field. So either dad's kind of a punk, right, and doesn't like his son, Maybe he just has too many kids. You know what I'm saying? How many got a lot of kids in your family? Sometimes you miss one here and there. It's fine, right? You can't, you know, as long as you got above 50%, that's a solid average. You know what I'm saying? Like at any given time. I grew up in a family with six kids, right? I got left a lot, right? So it was like you 
T-ball practice. No, not T-ball. I've been too young to be left there alone. Baseball practice as a kid, and all of a sudden, you know, everyone's gone. Mom and dad still haven't shown up yet to pick me up. I'd be just chilling on the side of the curb. Everybody's gone, you know. I juked the coach so he didn't, like, feel bad to stay and wait around for me. Uh, all of a sudden, the, the Ford Econoline van was the only thing big enough to hold eight people, you know, back then. And all of a sudden, Arr! You know, my mom comes flying in, you know, because I think that that song is like, that'll make them feel better if I'm coming in fast. You know what I'm saying? Like, they le- really let them know, like, I forgot you, but I feel bad about it. And so I'm coming in hot. You know what I mean? And so mom, mom just, you know, fly, oh, my God, my baby. You know, I was just like, I'm good, you know. And uh, so... <laughs> You know, maybe that was Jesse's deal. Maybe Jesse just saw a bunch of heads and thought they're all here and then realized it wasn't. But, but you know what? Actually, the reality is he, 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 he calls David, comes in, and God says, yeah, that's it. Anoint David. He's the next king. He's going to be it. So they anoint David. It's this powerful moment. And, but, you know, David's got to deal with right out of the gate. I'm getting anointed, but my dad forgot me. And actually, some scholars believe that part of the reason why David actually wasn't included in that lineup is because it's potential that David was actually the byproduct of an affair that that Jesse had had outside of the rest of his sons it's kind of why David was described very specifically uniquely even later on as he's king it talks about David's mom and it disappears that there there was probably a difference so potentially the prophet the pastor shows up at the house and he just does Jesse's a little bit embarrassed about the, the one child that didn't come the way he should have, and it may have been a little obvious because he didn't look like the rest of the kids, right? And so right from the get-go, David has, God is saying, I've called you, but he's got to deal with the second guesser going, yeah, but you're an accident. Yeah, but you got forgotten by your dad. Yeah, but you're, you know, no one's proud of you, ashamed. Your brothers are mad at you now. And he's got to deal with all of this right out of the gate, getting him to second guess his calling. His, his value, his purpose. So then time goes on. David's brothers go to war. They're a bit older, and David's with the sheep, hanging there, doing his thing. God's working with him and the sheep. His brothers are off at war. So one day his dad, Jesse, says, hey, take some food, go to your brothers, check up on them. They're fighting the Philistines over there. They've been battling for a while. I'm nervous. I need a report. I need an update on my kids. So David heads off and right away as soon as he gets there his brothers are already mad at him like what are you doing here you know i mean they're already like in his face and then as they're hanging out then all of a sudden the giant goliath comes up onto the scene shows up and he starts giving his taunt to god's people so i say man send a man to fight i'm gonna take you out and everyone's in fear except david this young kid he goes who in the world is this guy? Why are we letting him talk to us like that? Are you kidding me? So he's like, he's mad. He's ready to fight this guy. He's ready to go for it. He's, 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 dis, he's indignant about somebody to talk about his God like that. And then all of a sudden he hears like, whoever beats the giant gets no taxes forever and gets the king's daughter. He's like, let's go. Even if she's not great looking, at least there's no taxes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so he's getting pretty stoked. This is a good scene. This is a good deal. But as soon as he's hyped about it, his brother's here and they go, uh, what, are you ta- what are you doing running your mouth about this scene? And then they, they backhand and they go, they go, and who did you leave those few sheep with? Right? Just belittling them. Second guessing his his qualifications, second guessing his potential and his purpose. And life can be like that. We've got this, this sense inside of us that we want to make a difference in life. We want our life to matter. We want to do something of value. Yet there's all these voices that can often come, whether they be inside our own lives or from other people around us to, you know, challenge us, to doubt us, to get us to second guess the potential so David's running his mouth enough about taking out the giant that the king finally calls him in I love this the king's 
and you know, going to encourage him here a little bit or not. First Samuel seventeen thirty three. David saying, "I got this." Saul says, "You are not able." It's an unfortunate opener, right? He's thinking, "I'm going to do this." Saul says, "You're not able." to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. This guy's a giant. Goliath is not just a big dude. He is a literal giant from back in that era. And, you know, some of the, the last few actual literal giants like that. And, and so he's, Saul's like, this ain't going to happen, Dave. You don't stack up. You don't match the opponent. You're not equipped for this. You're not prepared. You're a young man. He's, he's been, he has been a literal champion since he was young. That's how big and massive he is. He's been winning heavyweight titles since before you were alive. This guy's insane. This guy's strong. You ain't got it. So just back up, chill out. Now, David must have been the greatest negotiator of all time because he somehow convinces the king of the nation to let him go out against the warrior unarmed, basically, except for with a sling and a rock. Like, if you got kids, some of y'all know some of your kids are great negotiators. You know what I'm saying? Like, my eldest daughter, she's a negotiator. She doesn't understand no. You say no, she just goes, okay, but, you know what I mean? Like, just, I was going to work an angle. I was going to try to weave you towards her ultimate end. And David must have been like this because he convinces him that it's a great idea that young David will go against the champion of the land with really just a rock versus a trained fighting machine. It'd be a little bit like sending my nine-year-old into the octagon with the top UFC champion of our era and going, go for it, Dave. You got it, (laughs) you know. They would be like, no, this is bad. That UFC fighter is going to rip somebody to, to pieces, yet this is what happens. Why? Because David, David was unafraid in this moment. He, he didn't have the fear that everybody else seemed to have. So something about it, Saul says, all right, Dave, you got it. So Dave has to keep pushing past the, the negative voices of, of his family, the negative voices uh, of the king of that time. And now he comes to face the giant in uh, verse 41 uh, here of, sec, of 1 Samuel 17 says, Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. So now David and Goliath are in battle. And it's actually two against one because the giant also has somebody in front of him with the shield. So this is, this is not stacking up good for Dave. So he looked at David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome. I get a kick that he is focused on how good looking David is. Some people like ruddy might, it could speak to his good lookingness or also he may have had red hair, right? So he's handsome and the giant despised him. Maybe because he had good hair. I don't know what it was. He said to David, am I a dog? You come at me with sticks. The Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. I'm going to give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, I love Dave. David second guesses the second guesser. Instead of just letting those words from Goliath sink in and get him to stop, he comes back at him. He says, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. It's like he's listing all of the things. It's like, he might have been like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, sword, spear, and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me. I'm going to strike you down, cut off your head. Sorry, this is not for four-year-olds. This is an intense story here. Today, I will give the carcass of the Philistines' army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. So David won up some. Goliath is like, I'm taking you out, feeding you to the birds. David's like, I'm going to get you and all your crew. You know what I mean? Like, you're all going to the birds. David just second guesses the second guesser. He's in his face, comes back at him. 
And, and why does he come back at him? He doesn't say, because I'm strong. You don't know I, I'm a part of an elite ninja force. So like, he, doesn't, he doesn't say anything like that. He says, because God's with me, because you've defied the God of the armies of heaven. You ta- I'm taking you out. See, David understood that, that if he was going to take out the giant, it wasn't going to be about his strength. It was going to be about God's. Uh, a, a couple of chapters earlier, one of his, his homies, Jonathan, Saul's son, is in battle again with the Philistines before this moment where David ultimately delivers uh, the Israelites out of the hand of the, of the Philistines. They're kind of in battle, but Jonathan is a little restless, and he's like, man, I want to take some people out. I'm done, I'm done sitting around waiting on this thing, let's go and fight. So there's like a group, there's an outpost of like 20 plus dudes. And Jonathan says in 1 Samuel 14, 6, Jonathan said to the young armor bearer, come, let's go over to that outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Just, you just had to chuck that in there, just a little bit rude. It almost feels like it might have been a, a, a curse word of the era or something like that, you know what I mean? He's just like jabbing at him. It said, perhaps, I love this, perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf. Like maybe, maybe not, 50-50 chance, but maybe God will work on our behalf. And I love this, love this. He says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So they go after it. So what David understood is what Jonathan understands in this moment is that nothing can hinder the Lord. So when, when David and, and when Jonathan in this moment are looking at the circumstances, he says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving whether by many or by few. What he's understanding is that whether I feel like I have everything I need or whether I feel like I've got nothing, that has no impact on God's ability to fulfill his purpose in my life. Okay? Your limitations... Do not limit God. Come on now, that's good news. Your limitations don't limit God. Most of the time, we, we get nervous and back away from the purposes of God because of our own limitations, as if God forgot you got limitations when he asked you to do something. It's like God's up there going, oh, Michael and Gabriel, why didn't somebody tell me Samuel is not qualified to do what I asked him to do? I wish a little bit of a resume update would have been made before I went ahead and called the kid. God already knew all my limitations before he called me to do what he asked me to do. God already knew all of your limitations, all of your issues, all of your attitude, all of your setbacks, all of your family drama, all of your dysfunctions, all of it, he already knew it, but he still called you because our limitations don't limit God. They, they don't limit God, amen? Because God can do and use anyone at any time from anywhere to do anything. I mixed that up for you, so I might have got confused. Let me repeat it, but in the right order. God can use anyone from anywhere at any time to do anything. That is the word of the Lord to you guys. Do do not allow the enemy to get you to shrink back, to get you to start second-guessing the goodness and power of God or to start second-guessing or or factoring your failure or success based on your own ability or limitations. If God called you, he knows all of your issues in advance, and he still called you, and he still chose you because it's not all about your ability, but it's about the power of God that he's made available to us, and that's how we fulfill the purpose of God. That's why David was able to take out the giant because he wasn't focused on his ability. He was focused on the power of God. Too many people, we shrink back in fear because we keep looking at the giants. We keep looking at the crowds instead of looking at Jesus, looking at the power of God. And when we do that, we can step into everything that God has for us. Amen? Amen. Let me just kind of, in our last kind of moments here together, let, let me just kind of talk through that phrase I've been saying and, and highlight it a little bit for us. So God can use 
anyone. Everyone say anyone. So God can use anyone. Now, when I mean anyone, I don't mean everyone but you. <laughs> I actually mean anyone. That means all of us in this room right now are usable by God to do his purpose on the earth. Anyone. God can use anyone. And God will use anyone. You know, the disciples that Jesus picked and selected, he didn't do it because they all scored the 4.0 at the top university of the era. He didn't choose them all because they were the, the, the top graduating pastors of the day. He chose, as you read through it, they were from all kinds of different backgrounds and abilities and, and skills. And later on, when they are taking the kingdom of God forward, because it's because of those 12, and of course Judas later got replaced, but because of the original 12 apostles, Disciples that became the apostles, you and I are sitting here today because of that group. Yet that group, they remarked about them in their era. They said, man, this is unbelievable what they're doing because these guys are uneducated, ordinary men. That was the statement about these guys. So God can use anyone. God isn't looking for you to get your act together before he can use your life. He's not looking for you to get the next degree under your belt before he can use your life. God's not looking for you to have all the right connections and all the right this and that. Man, God can use anybody. God can work in anybody's life. Amen? He even used the disciples. Ordinary, uneducated in that craft. And they, the Bible says they turned the world upside down. They turned the world upside down. Don't let the enemy disqualify you. Gets you to think that you don't have what it takes, that you're unselectable, that you're unusable by God. You can be used by God if you're just willing to allow him to work in your life. Amen. You know, God can use anyone, but he can use them from anywhere. Everyone say anywhere. Anywhere. You know, I think sometimes we think, well, man, to really do something great, it's like I got to either be connected or I got to get my break. Right? We live in an era of breaks, man. If I could just get, you know, the right hits on the right person to share my YouTube channel. If I could just, you know, get on America's Got Talent and get discovered. If we were trying to get a break, we live in California. It's like the land of trying to get a break. You know what I mean? Like, it's like the, the place. We're, we're near L.A. where half the servers are actors. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, it's like everyone's trying to get discovered and trying to get found and and our, our thought process can be, man, if, if I am not in the right place at the right time, nothing, is, something can't happen. Now, God does use time, place, and circumstances, but I'm telling you what, if God wants to do something in somebody's life, it don't matter if you're in the most obscure situation of, on the earth, God can elevate anybody from anywhere to do his purpose. I feel like that's a bit of the story of my life. I, I come from a, you know, a, a great family, but kind of in nowhere in Minnesota. I mean, my dad's a carpenter. My mom stayed at home and by the grace of God homeschooled all of us somehow. And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like I necessarily have the pedigree or have the uh, all, all of the right boxes ticked to, to feel like I want to change the world. But since a young age of 12, 13, I felt the call of God in my life to, to minister, to be a preacher, to pastor. And I felt always have always had this thing in me, man, I want to change the world. I want to make a difference. But here I'm just this young kid, kind of nobody knows me, I, on the backside of nowhere, just feeling like David with sheep in the sheep pen, just going, God, I want to change the world. God, I want to change the world. Not knowing how I would do it, not knowing what God would do, but now 25 plus years later down the track of following the call of God in my life, by God's grace, I've been around the world to preach the gospel and some great spaces to see God transform cities and cultures. I've, I've got, by God's grace, I, I wrote this kind of small little book called Following Jesus. Some of you guys maybe have gotten it because your church uses it here. It's for new believers and churches in over seven countries and multiple languages and it's getting translated into more languages right now. God is using this book to literally uh, impact the planet. So here I am now, impacting the planet like I dreamed of as a young child. But you know what? It's not because I'm great. <laughs> it's not because I have some special skill. 
It's just because God can use anyone <laughs> from anywhere. And I only bring that up to say, if God can use my life, if God can do something extraordinary in my life, he can do it in your life. What is that dream in your heart? What's that thing in your heart? What's that business you feel called to start? What's that ministry you feel called to build? What's that, uh, you know, the, the career in politics, in, in the arts, in production, in, in, in construction? You know, whatever it is, you've got something on the inside of you. A pizza shop. I don't know if I'm hungry or if I feel like I got a prophetic word, but somebody's going to start a pizza shop. <laughs> Could be both. I don't know. And God is going to raise you up, and God is going to do something uh, in, in your life. God can use anyone from anywhere. Don't, don't try to say, but God, you don't. I don't have the connections. I don't got the resource. I don't got this. God don't need that. Your limitations don't limit God. Amen. God can use somebody at any time. This is important to remember. Because one of the things that the, the great devil, the second guesser of our lives, well, he, he's good at work in every angle of this. When you're young, the devil says, man, you're too young. You can't make a difference. Better, better wait till you're older. Then guess what happens? When you get older, you're like, the devil's like, you're too old. You can't make a difference. Your time's expired. Man, he'll, he'll work on us on every side of this. But here's the reality. God can use anyone from anywhere at any time. You don't, you're not too young. You're not too old. You're not just right in between. Wherever you're at, if you're still breathing, God's got purpose. God's got destiny. God's got impact for you to have. God can use your life right now. It's not too late. It's not too late. You know, when I was younger, in, in Bible college, my peers would want to say something like, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to write a book. I've got a book I want to write. I was a bit cynical for some reason, even though in general I feel like I'm an encourager. I had this wrong thinking about age. And I, I was like, okay, go ahead and write the book. I'm not going to read it. That's what I said. I was like, why don't you wait until you have a little bit of experience on your belt before you go thinking you're going to write some book, tell people what to do. Like, who do you think you are? I was like David's brothers, like harassing people. Now, I'm somebody else's illustration that they're preaching about. But when I was in Bible college, this guy Samuel was talking crap about my dreams. And now look at me. You know what I mean? Like, that, I'm sure God's using that. I love how God can use everybody's story all at the same time and all of our dysfunction and still get us all where he wants us to go. But I, I, was, I was down on it because I was like, man, you know, wait till you're older. Then as I got older, I realized, man, what have I been doing? Why have I been saying that? God started highlighting different, obviously all throughout the Bible, God uses young people all the time. But then in history, God would use young people to change the world. And so now it's like, man, somebody's young and they say, man, I feel, I got some book I want to write, a, a program I want to start, something I want to build. I'm like, do it. Go for it. Don't wait. You don't got to wait 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. If something is in your heart, go ahead and go for it. Run after the call of God. Run after the purposes that God's put on the inside of your heart. God can use anyone. There's a great story of Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. God said, Abraham, you're going to be a father of many nations. The challenge is you've got to have kids to be that. <laughs> and uh, he had no kids. And uh, God told him they're going to have a kid, which is cool when you are able to have kids. But then decades went by, and now they're too old. They're past the age. Child, having kids is impossible at this point, physically and naturally. But it says that God enabled Sarah to have a child because she, she considered him faithful. She remembered the power of God. She remembered that, that nothing can hinder the Lord, that nothing can stop him, that my limits don't limit God, that my shortcomings don't limit God. And God enables her to have a child. And I'm telling you what, whether you feel like you're too young or you feel like the expiration date has come and gone on the call or the dream or the plan that you had, I'm telling you what, God can use anyone at any time. Do not limit God. Do not discount what God wants to do. And finally, he can do, use anyone from anywhere at any time to do anything. Anything. And whatever that one thing you thought, well, God can do everything but, no, no, he can also do that. <laughs> he can also do that thing. He can also do that impossible thing. God is a God of miracles. God is the God of the heavens and the earth. Nothing is too difficult for him. Nothing is beyond his scope. So if God calls you to do something, he can do it. He can fulfill it in your lifetime. Remember Mary, 
God comes on to this, this young girl, this angel shows up on the scene and says, Mary, we're trying to bring the Savior unto the earth, the Savior, and guess what? You're it. We're going to use your life. We want you to have a baby. His name's going to be Jesus. It's going to be the Savior of the world. It's going to be amazing. And then Mary does, yeah, that's a pretty legit question. Wait, hold up. How's this going to happen? I don't have a husband, and I am not partying. So you're going to have to update me on the plan. <laughs> and God says, the Holy Spirit's going to get involved. The Holy Spirit's going to get involved. He does the first in vitro. It's amazing. <laughs> God does the first thing, right? Mary, Mary's like, man, how's it? God says, I'm going to get involved. And that's the reality. God can use anyone from anywhere at any time to do absolutely anything, but we got to respond like Mary. We've got to have that response where Mary says, man, listen, that's crazy. No one's ever done that before. I've never heard of that. This is, this is a, a crazy plan. This is out of the box plan. But she just responds with, hey, let it be done to me according to your word. Let it be done. I, I don't understand it all, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to say yes to your plan. I'm going to say yes to the purposes of God in my life. And when we do that, God can do the impossible. God can reach a city. God can transform a nation. God can bring a people back to God. You know what? America needs the church to rise up in a way that it never has before, to repoint people back to Jesus again. We need that. And God's going to use your lives collectively as a church. God's going to use whatever that business or ministry or, or gifting that you have, God's going to use that to continue to point people back to him. God can do anything. You know that dream that's crazy that you haven't shared with anybody? God can do that. <laughs> you know that thing you, you thought was possible 10 years ago, but now you're kind of, it's too late? Now God can still do that. God can do that. Because you can do anything with anyone at any time from anywhere. It doesn't matter. God can use your life. Amen. I'm going to close with this verse and then we're going to pray. Jeremiah 32 verse 27. This is God speaking. He says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. I love this. Is anything too hard for me? No, nah, nothing is. Nothing's beyond his reach. Nothing's beyond his scope. Nothing's beyond his potential. I'm here to, to inject faith into the, to the room again. That's what I feel like. That's my assignment this morning. Is to remind you, of course, of this obsessive phrase I've been saying over and over again. Which I'm going to say one more time. That God can use anyone from anywhere at any time to do anything. And I just pray that that echoes in your heart and in your mind all week long and let it stir faith in you again. The things that you've let die, let it revive them again to say, God, you're the God of the impossible. You're able. You're able. I trust you again. I'm, I'm willing to say yes again. Let, let me just pray for anyone in the room. And maybe you could just by a show of hands if you say, man, this message is for me. Maybe there's some things you'd kind of let go of. Maybe there's some fear that you've had to step into what God has for you. Maybe you felt like some things have expired. Maybe, there could be a variety of things, but you feel like, man, this, this was my word. Just lift up your hand. Let me know who I'm praying with here this morning. Yeah. A lot of us front to back. Just keep your hand lifted up. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would breathe fresh faith again, hope again. Let, it, let the dreams come alive again. Let your purpose come alive again. God, let boldness to obey what you've already said, what you've spoken to them about. God, I thank you that you're not done with them yet. You're not finished with them yet. They're not too young. They're not too old. God, that you can do anything with their life if they're just willing to say yes, if they're disobedient to respond to you. Father, I just come against any lie of the enemy. The second guesser, try to get them to doubt their call, doubt their purpose, and doubt their potential. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that truth would reign in their lives, that the word of God would echo in their spirit instead of the lies of the enemy. God, let them know you. Let them experience you. Let them come close to you again in a fresh way. God, I pray for boldness 
for faith to rise up, to take the place that you call for them in Jesus' name. If you receive that, give God a hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, God. Let me ask one more question before, before you guys head out here with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed. I, I don't want to leave this moment without asking the most important question that we all have to ask is, is your relationship with God right? Hey, have you ever made the decision to follow Jesus, I mean, with everything that you are, to receive the grace of God that covers your sin? You know, our sin, why do we need to be forgiven by Jesus? Because our sin separates us from God. But that wasn't God's plan. All we have to do is accept the grace of God that comes to us because Jesus died on the cross and paid the price that we had. We owed, but we couldn't pay. And when we receive that, He forgives all of our sins and brings us in right relationship with God. That means that heaven is our home, but it also means that God wants to create heaven on earth in your life here in this world as well. So I want to give you that chance. If you're away from God, maybe you've never made the decision and this is your day. This is the moment you're finally ready. Like, man, I'm ready. It's time. I started doing it my own way. I'm going to start following Jesus. Or maybe you've done that in the past, but if you're honest, you feel like you're away from God. You haven't been really serving and following Him. And you want today to be a day where you're back on track. You're drawing a line in the sand and saying, come on, I'm all in, Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed, because I want this to be a moment between you and God. If that's you, Say, count me in. Pray with me on the count of three. I just want you to lift up your hand. One, two, three. Across the room. Lift up your hand. Let me know. Awesome. Great, great, great. Fantastic. Anybody else? Man, there's so many of you. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands raised up so I can know who I'm praying with. Awesome. Awesome. Man, just so many. Here's what we're going to do. Everyone is lifting up your hands. In a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of commitment to following Jesus, putting your faith in him. But the whole church, we're going to pray right along with you and believe with you for God to come alongside, bring you close, forgive your sins, make you new again. So church, and especially those raising your hand, I want you all to repeat this just passionately with me, knowing that God's hearing you and that God's responding to you. Everyone say this. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sin and raise him from the dead to give me life. Jesus, I follow you with everything that I have, heart and soul, I'm all in. Lead me and I will follow in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Come on church, let's give it up. For those who just made that decision, so proud of you guys.